How's it guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we will be doing basic dive medicine. So if you know something about dive medicine or you are a diver or whatever the case is, this may not be the right video for you. However, what we will be discussing is three of the important bits and pieces about gas laws, three important bits about what you need to know about diving if you're not a diver, and then three bits of pieces of information that you need to know when you are treating a patient who has just been diving. So let's jump into those gas laws. Gas laws are important because obviously when we're diving, we're dealing with pressures and when we're diving deep, we're dealing with pressurized air and that affects our body in different ways. In the same way as if we go up a mountain, we have lower pressures and if we go down into water, we have higher pressures. The gas laws are quite critical for you to understand so that when you are treating a patient, you have a better understanding of what the problem is or why it might have been caused. The first important gas law, when pressure goes up, volume goes down. And when volume goes up, pressure comes down. So they are inversely related. A good example of this would be if we blow up a balloon at sea level and we take it to the top of Mount Everest, will it be bigger or smaller? It'll be bigger. The balloon volume got bigger, which means the pressure on the balloon got less. The same would happen if we took that same balloon down to 30, 40 meters underwater, the pressure gets bigger so your volume gets smaller. So you see how they are inversely proportionate. And we will just discuss later why that is important. The next law is called, names aren't that important. What is important is that when there is pressurized gas above a liquid, it is proportionate to how much gas is um, saturated in that liquid. So a good example is a Coke can. A Coke can is pressurized. So the air above the Coke is pressurized to a certain level. And so the more the Coke can is pressurized, the more gas is dissolved into the Coke. And when we open the Coke can, we have that sudden release of that pressure, which now means that the gas comes out of the liquid. I assume when they make a can of Coke, they pump the pressure into that can. And what happens is that then that pressure or well, that gas slowly gets pushed into the Coke. You see, it's one way in, one way out sort of thing. This is not a sponsored video of Coca-Cola. The third law that is important or third gas thing that's relative is that air is made out of parts or pieces. So you have oxygen and you have nitrogen and all those bits and pieces. So in air, there is 21% oxygen and there's 78% nitrogen. And then there's like a couple of percent or whatever it is of other gases. Who knows what those are? What's important to understand is that the sum of all of these gases make up air and then that makes up the partial pressure of air, which is how much of each gas separately there is in the amount of air we're breathing. At sea level, the percent of oxygen is 21%. And on the top of Mount Everest, the percentage of oxygen is 21%. Fact. The reason why this is, is that when you look at how much oxygen, or rather the concentration of oxygen is the same, but the pressure is different. Remember pressure and volume. If you took a balloon of air, let's say you put a liter of air into a balloon and you took it to Mount Everest, that balloon is much bigger, which means for me to breathe in the same amount of oxygen, let's say that there was five oxygen in the balloon at sea level, at the top of Mount Everest, there's still only five oxygen in that same balloon. So I now need to breathe in a whole lot more air to get the same amount of oxygen as I did on sea level. The reverse is true when you're scuba diving. If you're 20, 30, 40 meters below sea level, that balloon that has now five, five oxygen is now compressed into a little bubble. So when I take in a breath, I might be breathing in 10, 15, 20 oxygen. And now you can see why when we're deeper, there's more pressure. So our volume is smaller. And so in each breath, we're actually breathing in more oxygen. And so you have something called like oxygen toxicity or nitrogen toxicity. So because now we're not breathing in 78% nitrogen, we breathe, we actually breathing in a lot more of that concentrated nitrogen. But let's not jump ahead. So the three things you need to know about diving is that the rule says you plan your dive and you dive your plan. What that's pretty much saying is that you need to know what you're going to do and then do it so everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing and you all plan for it to succeed and you're not obviously planning for things to fail. That would be a bit counterintuitive. So these sort of plans consider something called a dive table. This is a dive table. And if you see there's the depth and how long you can stay there on air, so on 21% oxygen. 
if you look at the 40 meters, you can only spend a couple of minutes there. It's like three or four minutes at 40 meters. But if you go all the way up to like 10 meters, you can spend two hours. In reality, you could spend longer at 40 meters. You, you could definitely spend more than just that time. So you could definitely spend more than just the three or four minutes at 40 meters, but then you will go into something called your decompression time, meaning that you're gonna have to do some stops on the way up to then get out. So nowadays we have a dive computer. It looks something like this or like that, or even like this. And what these do is that they allow us to not have to study these dive tables before we go diving. It allows us to know exactly what kind of pressures we're taking on and how much nitrogen we're taking on so that we know um, when is too much and we know when to come up. So the way this works, and it would be beneficial for you to know, is that dives generally work in like a, you go down and then you come up and then you come up and then you come up and then you go out. So it's kind of like a straight down, then you do these steps back up to the surface. Um, and the reason why this happens is that if you have a dive computer on and you go down to 40 minutes, a timer starts on the watch. And this is called your no deco time, so no decompression time, which means that if this hits zero, you're going to have to do a decompression stop, a mandatory decompression stop. So you dive down to 30, 35 meters and it will say eight minutes and then it will count down for eight minutes and it might get to five or four minutes. Then you go up five meters and then that timer will go up because you have longer at that time. And as you move further up, you get more time because of more or because of less pressure you're taking on less nitrogen and so therefore you have a longer period at that time. The average dive, you're supposed to do a three minute stop at five meters as a precautionary decompression stop. It isn't a mandatory stop, it's a recommended safety stop. Uh, this is because the amount of pressure from five meters to surface is a huge change in pressure and so we like to just stop there for three minutes. If you don't listen to the watch, the watch will then tell you you need to stop at 10 meters for like 20 minutes and then you can stop at five for like 10 minutes and then you can come up. If you don't listen to the watch three times in a row, it switches off and says, I can't accurately tell you um, what gases or how much nitrogen you've taken on. And therefore it kind of just switches off and says, I can't take responsibility for your actions because you're not listening to it anymore. I thought that was very interesting. What a dive normally looks like is you jump and you go all the way to the bottom, your watch counts down, you move up, your watch counts down, you move up, your watch counts down. You stop at five meters for three minutes for a safety stop and then you come to the surface. In doing so, you never went into decompression, meaning that you're not gonna have a, a major problem with your nitrogen. The problem when this doesn't go according to plan or if people dive what, what's called yo-yo diving when they go down up down up down up they're taking on such huge amounts of nitrogen and they're not even sure how much and when and where and like for how much time they've had which is called your bottom time how much time do they actually spend at the bottom because that is how much nitrogen they've taken on so the important bit that you need to take from this is that dive watches have a lot of information on them especially if you have a dive patient or patient who has or is requiring dive medicine because they've now um, taken on too much nitrogen they come to the top and they have a stroke or we'll get to that later then the dive watch is important and should stay with the patient and must go to hospital with the patient because that will tell because you can take a dive computer plug it into it and it will draw the graph it will explain what their bottom time was their pressures how long this and that, everything. It'll explain how fast they came up, how fast they went down, as well as any consecutive diving. So on the dive table, you see, so you have your first dive, but then you carry nitrogen over from your first dive to your second dive. And then from your second dive, you carry nitrogen over to your third dive. So if you do a 40 meter dive on your first dive, you can actually only do like 20, 25 meters on your second dive. And on your third dive, you can probably do like 10, 15 meters. And the amount of time you have, they decreases and decreases and decreases because you carry that nitrogen for, for about 24 hours, depending on a whole bunch of factors, age, weight, health. Dive tables help you carry that amount of nitrogen, but also the dive computer does it a much better job. So once you're done with your dive, it will tell you how much surface time you need. You know, it might be about like half an hour or an hour where you need to stay out of the water. But then again, if you're not listening to how you're supposed to dive, you're going to have much bigger problems. So let's talk about the things that can go wrong. The other thing about diving that you need to understand is that at sea level, you have one atmosphere above you. Everywhere on the earth, you have one, one atmosphere. When you go 10 meters underwater, you now have two atmospheres and three, four, five. So at 40 meters underwater, you have five atmospheres on top of you. And the reason why this is important is that, as we were saying, is that if you had a balloon and you took it deeper, that 
five oxygen goes from being this big to this big to being very small. So when I take a normal breath in, I might be breathing in 20, 25 oxygens, just as a point of information, not that it's 20, 20 oxygens, whatever that means. When you're going deeper, you're breathing in more oxygen. So that's when you get something called oxygen toxicity. So when you go very deep, then your partial pressure or how much actual oxygen in the air you're breathing is increased. If your partial pressure of oxygen gets more than like, I think it's like 1.4 or 1.6, you can get oxygen toxicity. So you could work it out. At, at surface level, we're breathing in 0.21. At 10 meters, we're breathing in 0.42. At 20 meters, we're breathing in 6.3 and so on and so forth. And as it gets to 1.4 or 1.6, depending on where you are, um, you then get oxygen toxicity, but that's at like 80, Maybe, I think, it's, I think it's like 80 or 90 meters, and that's very deep. That's not recreational diving, so you're probably not going to see oxygen toxicity in recreational diving if they're diving on air. The other or final point of what's important to understand about diving is that people can dive on mixed gas. So because air is 21% oxygen and 78-odd percent nitrogen, 78, I think it is, then what happens is that people then increase the amount of oxygen and decrease the amount of nitrogen because the nitrogen is what is the real problem here. So people increase the amount of oxygen and they decrease the amount of nitrogen so that then they are able to stay in the water for longer because the nitrogen is a problem where the oxygen is not. But now that you are increasing your oxygen, you have a higher chance of having oxygen toxicity. So it depends on what percent of oxygen you have and what percent of nitrogen you have. These tanks are labeled. The person who's diving with them is supposed to know what they're doing. And so how this really works, to simplify this quickly, depending on how deep you want to go will depend on how much oxygen to nitrogen ratio you want to have. So because if you're only going to go like very, very shallow, it's okay to take on a lot more oxygen. I think the max is like 40% oxygen. And so you can dive at like 10, 15 meters for hours with no problem. Or you can have slightly less oxygen and slightly more nitrogen and you can dive at like 30 meters for much longer than you would normally to a normal dive table. The dive computer is linked to your tank and so the computer knows what mixture you have in the tank and so it's able to calculate your compressions and your stops and your, your nitrogen intake and all those sorts of questions. Then the three or so things about diving that would be useful to know. So there's something called the bends. Um, it's when you have too much nitrogen in your body and you come up too quickly, you're like a Coke can opening. And what happens is that the gas that is in your blood becomes bubbles in your blood. In the same way, when you open up a Coke, there's that rapid decompression of the can that happens in your blood and your blood starts to bubble. And we all know that air in your blood is not a good thing. Uh, or air bubbles in your blood is not a good thing because that is going to cause strokes and joint pain and headaches and all that sort of thing. So you can imagine why that's a problem. It's actually called the bends because the people who used to dive a long time ago and didn't quite know what this was would always be bent over and crooked because their joints were so messed up from the bubbles getting, getting caught in their joints. The way we avoid getting bent or getting the bends or decompression illness, DCI, is that we plan our dive and we dive our plan, we have our watches, we know what we're doing and we listen to our watches in terms of how fast we come up, in terms of how long we stay at what depth and we stay out of no decompression time. So if we do all those things, if we listen to the watch, if we plan our dive, you're not going to be in a place where you get DCI. So what happens is people can panic and quickly rush to the surface. People can have problems with their tank. Maybe they run out of air. They quickly rush to the surface. Maybe they lose their weight belt somehow or something happens. And so then they quickly shoot or they have a problem with their um, flotation device and they quickly shoot up to the surface. These are um, things that do happen. Sometimes people get away with it. Oftentimes they don't. The only real treatment for these patients is that you want to keep them horizontal because you don't want the bubbles to be, if I'm sitting and I've got bubbles in my blood, the bubbles are going to raise to my head and give me a stroke or go to my lungs or my heart. So we keep them flat or we keep them in the, we, um, in the Trendelenburg position, which then causes the bubbles to go towards the feet and that helps the bubbles stay away from the head, the brain and the heart. You're going to give these patients lots of oxygen as much as you can and they need to go to a decompression chamber or a compression chamber, whatever you want to call it. 
those big cylinders, they're pumped full of air. Hopefully it's big enough so that you can have a person inside there to help them. If you do have one of these near you or around you, I'd recommend you go see it. You speak to the people there and you learn how to contact these people in the event of an emergency. If you have someone who has proper DCI, the only treatment is recompression. Some people might be like, well, why don't you just chuck them back in the ocean? Uh, you, you could, but you would need to spend probably an hour or so at like 10 meters, 5, 10, 10 meters. And that is too much oxygen because you're going to run out of tanks. That is also a problem in terms of um, hypothermia because you will become hypothermic at that um, depth for that length of time. And there's just so many other complications. They could have a seizure, they could have a stroke at that level, and now they're at 10 meters under the water. So put, putting them back in the water is a solution um, as much as not doing anything would also be a solution. So that's kind of DCI. The other one is what I mentioned is oxygen toxicity. That happens at a partial pressure. So when there's like 25, 50, 100 oxygen um, in the air you're breathing. And so you are pretty much breathing in like 160% oxygen kind of in a way that the amount of oxygen in your blood causes you to have a seizure. This isn't going to happen on normal air because you can't go deep enough to get that. But if they're on a mix, you can get trimixes where they have like helium and other gases. We're not going to be diving into that in this video. Diving. Um, but so it's important to understand. So when someone has, a, has too much oxygen on board, they will have a seizure oxygen toxicity. They will also have like numbing of the hands and so they will then pass out probably, they will probably carry a tank of um, normal air and they'll carry a tank of like trimix or um, nitrogen and helium so that if they do have a seizure or they have a problem, they bash on the air which is 21% oxygen and then they come up to the surface. If they are on the surface, they've had a seizure, you wanting to make sure that they're ventilating but you're not wanting to pump them full of oxygen because they're now have oxygen toxicity. They are hyper, hyperoxic. They're hyperoxic, and that is just too much oxygen in their blood. Obviously, the third thing about diving that would be good to know is that there is something called nitrogen narcosis. So what that is is that when you take on nitrogen, it's kind of like you're getting drunk when you swim or when you scuba. So they kind of say that at every 10 meters you scuba you're taking like a shot of tequila or vodka or you're having a cocktail every single 10 meters you go down. So at 10 meters, that's a shot. At 20 meters, that's a shot. At 30 meters, that's a shot. At 40, and so you go down, down, down. They get tunnel vision, they do strange things. I heard of a story of someone who took their demand valve, the thing they breathe out of, and they were trying to give the fish air because they were so like looney tuned at the bottom. Um, people make mistakes people get hurt. Uh, this is something that you can get, get accustomed to. Your body can become resilient to the nitrogen narcosis, but it's important to know what that feels like, what that looks like. And this isn't really gonna be a problem on the surface because once you come up, all these symptoms disappear. But this is a reason why people make mistakes deep down. So guys, I hope that this was informative and to the point. Um, if you have any other questions, if you've ever had to treat a diving patient or someone who has the bends or you've been bent or whatever the case is, I'd love to know it in the comments. And guys, once again, thank you so much for watching and for your time and I hope you have a good day. Bye for now.